Transistor is a game made to be vague by design, and that was not a poor design. There's a very noticeable distinction between games that do vagueness right and games that don't, and when you have a concrete, consistent message or aesthetic theme that is evoked by all, if not most, elements of the game, then it can generally pull off this style of storytelling in a way that's satisfying without actually spilling the beans behind what's going on. If the story is compelling enough, then there is value to be gleaned from the effort of figuring out that story. It's kind of a meta-gamey challenge that engages the player with the fan community outside of the game. I guess my favorite example of that engagement happening in real life would be Metal Gear Solid 2. Or a more relevant and current example is probably Dark Souls. There's a real feeling of accomplishment when fan theories and alternate interpretations actually reveal hidden truths behind a convoluted plot. It's not unlike the process of feeling a sense of accomplishment after overcoming actual game challenges. And I'm seeing this process happening right now in the Transistor fan community. And that is because this game's story is vague, but not nonsensical. It's a story with complicated, off-screen characters who you never see, but they do have understandable motives and they play out a plot that can be reliably followed. It has a universe and a message that can be interpreted a number of different ways, but it still sticks to a few subtle themes and rules that keep those interpretations grounded around the same concepts. It subverts cliches and tropes in a way that makes it intimidating and unapproachable, but it does that out of necessity to give the story its flavor. There's a lot going on in this story, and since the things going on are framed inside a very alien universe, I think it would be a good idea to start by trying to understand that universe. Transistor takes place inside of a digitized reality where mundane aspects of daily life fizzle in and out of existence via computerized instructions. The way this works is that popular vote determines how society changes, and it's up to admins to input the necessary instructions that implement those changes. Cyberpunk fiction usually takes place in a dystopia, but Transistor's situation is very much a utopia. It doesn't look like the city of Cloudbank has a whole lot of problems going for it. They are beyond economics. Food is apparently complimentary. You don't see issues of poverty and inequality when you're on the ground exploring. And in fact, the few characters we are exposed to are all self-fulfilled, ambitious overachievers who have the freedom to be able to excel at their dream job. They're also all kind of introverts. The people of this society are so used to the peace and quiet of this situation that when they start to go missing, other people do not suspect foul play. The only real problem they have is the mental banality of maintaining a system that literally manifests the will of the people. One of the admins of Cloudbank has apparently fought for virtually every social position at only 55. Royce, the engineer, notices that people want to build bridges, railways, and parks in predictable patterns. And Asher, the news reporter, notices that the city's history is suspiciously undocumented. Together, they form a secret committee dedicated to solving those mysteries and decreasing the banality. When everything changes, nothing changes. You see? When everything changes, nothing changes. That motto refers to the cyclical nature by which Cloudbank changes. Since Cloudbank changes predictably, over and over again, its long-term history doesn't really change at all, while its short-term history constantly does. Royce looks into those patterns of change and discovers a mathematical formula behind it all. That's the process. It's hinted that the robotic minions of the process that you fight come from some other state of reality outside of the city. But it's also hinted that the actual process of changing things in Cloudbank is also intimately related to the process controlling those monster robot thingies. They aren't necessarily evil so much as they create and destroy at the instruction of the admins. Without instruction, they automatically reset the world to a blank, white, lifeless state that is ready to await further instruction. So what Royce does to control the process is develop the transistor, which is a piece of hardware designed to transform people into software whose qualities can be used by the admins to send out instructions to control the process, which changes things physically. In real life, transistors are devices that control the flow of electrons, and by extension electricity. They are used to amplify electronic signals or to switch them on or off. 
In the game, the transistor is a device that controls the flow of the qualities of the people it absorbs. It can turn their functions on and off, or amplify their uses onto different functions to physically change the world around it by instructing the process to do things. In game, this is manifested as combat against the process, with you figuratively typing out lines of code that terminate those processes. And because of all that, that's why I call this game a digitized reality. Lots of digital things are happening in this universe. There's actually a very big push in the fan community towards canonizing Cloudbank as a simulated city rather than a physical city existing in an actual reality. Maybe that's why they call evacuated areas offline pending investigation. If you've ever set up a private server to run an MMO in an offline mode, you'd get the analogy. You don't see the active logins of the other users running around populating this place. You just see enemy mobs and the architecture of the map itself. Even the name Cloudbank suggests that this is all an online digital space. It's the location of the final boss that throws the whole existential dilemma of this universe up to interpretation. You might be getting sucked into the cradle or the transistor here, but I don't believe you're inside of the transistor because of these two quotes. Funny things about the transistor. Let's see. You can get in, but you can't get out. How about that? You can get in, but it's a one-way street, a one-way road. It's like the country. I've seen inside it. Had myself a little look. But I didn't see much, didn't see much at all. It was like staring at the sky. And I don't believe you're inside the cradle because Roy says you've made it outside of Cloudbank. So, now, we're here. Not there. We're stuck. Wherever you are, there are these 15 containers holding the traces of the people who have been absorbed by the transistor up to that point and slightly out of bounds or even more of them. So if you're not inside the transistor or the cradle, but are still in a place that has some kind of alternate version of the people you've encountered in Cloudbank, then maybe this stage is actual reality. Maybe the cradle is both the computer that powers the Cloudbank world and a gate to escape to the real world. Maybe the cradle is also the bank that stores the trace versions of the people who are connected to their Cloudbank versions. Maybe this is the real life version of the cradle. Maybe that's why when you look at it from inside Cloudbank, it's a big big abstract red cube-like thing, but when you look at it from outside Cloudbank, it's awfully close to looking like a literal server farm. It's an agricultural field of containers holding the digitized versions of souls. Come to think of it, maybe that's also why you don't hear about these people reproducing or having kids, because they're not actually real human bodies. Anyways, this place looks like a countryside, and going to the country is used in a way that sounds, to the player, like a euphemism for death. But we never get real clarification for what going to the country actually means. If the countryside is real life, then maybe this society equivalates death with returning to the real world. Which implies that real life got so screwed up somehow that everyone would really rather live in a virtual utopia instead. After all, that's the fate that our protagonist chooses for her own self. Given the choice to rebuild a utopia but without anyone to populate it, she chooses to exist inside of a third layer of reality, one within the transistor that looks like an idyllic version of the country, which is also what the real-world cradle location looks like. The only difference is that in there, the souls of the people it absorbed apparently have bodies and voices and can be interacted with as if standing face to face. That ending is the one part of this story that I can't really say I dig, though. It's the hardest to figure out, and if it really does mean that our main character is committing suicide because loneliness, then that suddenly seems like a bit of a selfish motivation. But we are often reminded that Red is her own character and that we're not in control of her personality. But it is sappy, though. It's the love conquers all shtick that also seems like a way to cop out the duty of writing in her newfound responsibilities. She now understands the Transistor's world-building potential, but decides it's ultimately worthless without anyone to share it with. I, I don't know, I mean, it's a rational decision, but it all happened very fast, and we as players did it without a lot of input from her side. But if absorbing herself into the Transistor does, in fact, mean traveling to a different plane of existence from the digitized reality of Cloud Bank, then I can kind of see what they were going for here. In that case, being absorbed into the Transistor would not mean death, and the stuff we see during the credits would not be the afterlife, but rather another virtual world that Red logged into. Probably with the root access and world building power she gained in Cloud Bank. That's why there would be stuff there, right? It was like staring at the sky. 
If death really is not final in this universe, and it doesn't seem to be, then I can be more comfortable with that ending. Instead of a selfish, although understandable suicide, her action would then seem more like an acceptance that Cloud Bank was a failed experiment, and that it was time to try another one. A directly democratic utopia controlled by popular vote was apparently bound to fail, and so was a technocracy controlled only by the most qualified experts. But what that ending presents to us is the idea that this game isn't just about grand philosophical sociological theories, but also about the power of love and humanity, which I still think is sappy. But it's got a relatable message in there about what makes life worth living and what makes relationships meaningful. Red's supposed suicide doesn't happen because she's helpless without her man, but rather because she actively makes the decision to value human interaction above the social perception of greatness which pits her at the polar opposite of the Camerata's ideals. The greatness of rebuilding Cloud Bank in her image, or even in the image of the people absorbed in the transistor, means nothing to her. So she chooses the alternative. So that's what I think the themes and the universe of this game are supposed to represent. I still love the smaller details you could easily miss, like how Sybil sings Red songs before you fight, or how her speech is decipherable, or how Red has this wedding band which suggests that the narrator is her husband, or how they're gay characters and you might not even have noticed they were gay because they were treated the same as other characters. I don't know, I thought that was kind of neat. There's too much to talk about here, but what I appreciate is the fact that there is stuff to talk about. Transistor is written to be vague in a way that doesn't shrug off detail, but rather it encourages conversations. It's built to get fans talking about it and discussing it. So let's talk about it. 